We're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. I'm Alex. I hope you guys are all sitting nice and comfortable wherever you are and you've been safe and taking care of yourself and your families. Um, I think we're all starting to get used to this, which is a little scary. Um, it was funny. We were talking on, on uh, in the room before we signed on. And for some of us, this really isn't a change. I mean, we're retired or we work from home, so it isn't all that much of a change. And yet it does feel like a pretty big change. And uh, so just hang in there. We will get through it and we'll get through it pretty well. I um, want to thank Tolga for his operation today. He's done a really good job filling up our calendar. And uh, so I want to go over to that calendar and I'll start by sharing my screen if I could here. Um, share screen, my entire screen, share. And um, we got Richard coming up. Oh, by the way, all, all our friends down in Central Florida, we know you're there. Richard knows you're there. So you be nice to him, okay? We know that you're there and following him and and uh, we expect nice, respectful questions. We expect you to, yeah, sure, play stump to Richard. Sure, go ahead. We know what you're doing out there. Um, but let's get to the calendar. All right, um, tonight we've got Richard Wright. Mr. Wright will be here to tell us about the, um, the transition from CCD to CMOS and uh, you know, it, always gets a bunch of responses over on um, on uh, uh, cloudy nights or any place else you want to bring it up. And and here tonight, we're going to have somebody who actually knows this stuff and will be telling us about it. Eric Adams is coming next week. He wrote an article on, uh, on a, found it on a website and it was about, you know, this is the perfect time for us to sit down and learn about astrophotography. And he talked about a lot of things, but uh, yeah, he'll be here next week and tell us about it. Plane Wave Instruments is coming in with Matt Dietrich the next week. And then we've got one of two people coming in to tell us about comet processing the week after that on May 3rd. Brian is coming in to tell us about how to do it in Deep Space Stacker and Photoshop, I think. And Robert Traub is going to be telling us about how to do Insight comet processing with um, uh, PixInsight, obviously. And... Um, it's a it's a whole different operation and it's much different than it used to be taking pictures of comets and we got all of that ready because by may when um comet atlas gets close to the sun it should be it should be about as big as the full moon it's bigger than mars even mars was when when, when mars was as big as the full moon except of course the comet atlas blew apart this last week and so all our beautiful presentations about Comet processing, we'll, we'll have to learn about it and then do it when, when we get our chance to take a picture of a comet. I'm involved in a, a, some citizen science um, in a uh, Bob Massey and Dennis Vita um, run a program. Well, Bob doesn't run the program, but he talked me into getting it. So he's my local contact where um, I've got a meteor camera up at the top of my roof and it tracks all the comets no comet will go unobserved and dennis vita and bob massey will tell us how we can get into that on may 10th manny's going to tell us about how he built his observatory up in northern california and uh, he's he's got a real nice observatory out there and i've seen pictures of it and stuff so i've asked him to present on it robert zellum is another example of citizen science he's going to tell us how we can with our own equipment that we already have look for exoplanets. Now you'll see that we are good and stacked up on our schedule all the way up until May 31st, but we need more people after that, okay? I also wanna remind you that we are over here. Uh, let me turn that off. Uh, you're over here making your comments and on I see Tadej was already, yeah, Tadej has um, sent us five euros and that's really nice. We really appreciate it. You know, it does cost to put on the show. Um, and uh, Adam did it before us and Tolga and, and uh, Eric, me, and we, we've all kind of pitched in on doing it. And we do appreciate now we're starting to get donations. We could also use people signing in, subscribing to the program. Um, so please 
go ahead and subscribe to the program and go ahead and push those little buttons that, that send us some money every now and then so that we can um, we can continue programming this stuff. See the big subscribe button down here, the big red button down here? If you subscribe to that, eventually it helps us a lot in our efforts to become a, a big YouTube station. Now, we don't care about being a big YouTube station, but we care about reaching a lot of people. And the more support we can get from YouTube, um, the better we can do that. They'll start helping us uh, in more ways. So please pitch in on that. Okay, that's enough about um, subscribing and sending us some, some donations if you can and stuff like that. I'm going to turn it back over to Richard because Richard's one of my favorite people. You can always depend on him knowing what he's talking about. So, Richard, take it away. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. So, let me, all right, me and computers here. Let me share my screen. Share the right screen, of course. Click. So, you see a big moon up there. And, all right, so here we are. So, uh, changing of the guard. I've been talking a lot about this lately. Uh, I wrote a an article in a recent issue of Sky and Telescope uh, on this topic. And um, uh, I think I had written a blog about it for the Sky and Telescope website a couple of months before that. And then I spoke about it at the Winter Star Party. And Alex is right. Everybody wants to know about CCD and CMOS. And it's, uh, it's a great way to pick a fight. I mean, start a very lively conversation at an astronomy club or a group of integers uh, getting together uh, to talk about it. Um, and so it, it is a uh, it's a technology transition that we're going through. And like all technology transitions, uh, there are going to be uh, some growing pains while it happens. But it's happening, uh, whether we like it or not. And no matter what we think, uh, it is going to happen. Uh, it, it, kind of a cautionary tale is um, I remember, uh, you know, I've been in computers for a long time. And I remember reading PC Magazine. It was that. Uh, John C. Dvorak, uh, he was an editor. He was a bit of a curmudgeon. He liked to complain about everything. And I remember specifically him complaining about digital cameras versus film cameras. And uh, I remember too, because I hated digital cameras for, for a while, there, there was a certain uh, plateau they needed to get to before I was gonna be happy uh, giving up my, uh, my SLR for a DSLR. Uh, a digital camera, and he talked about uh, the horrors of how big the pixels were compared to fine grain films, and uh, you know the quality of the of the images from uh, from film versus cameras, and and he just it, digital cameras are never ever going to catch up with film cameras uh, in in any way because it's just it's just the fool's errand, and the thing is he was right, uh, he was absolutely right about all of the technical details. Uh, that he was talking about the the size of film grains and sensitivity and all those sorts of things at the in the in the very beginning, uh, just like a lot of people when they're comparing CMOS and CCD, you know, uh, we get into the engineering aspects and you know all these different things we can measure and in so many ways, um, you know, uh, one technology is better than the other. But what he failed to understand was that these limitations were temporary. What he failed to understand was that the people in that industry weren't just as dissatisfied as he was and that they weren't working day and night to overcome those uh, limitations. Uh, he also failed to, to recognize the huge economic incentive um, behind digital, digital cameras, not having to pay for film processing, uh, the speed with which you could take a photo and look at it on the back of the camera and make adjustments and take it again. Uh, these things, they're just monumental forces that move things forward. Uh, and it made, you know, the, the time where film was much better than digital cameras, those, those sorts of things, people cared about those sorts of things. And a lot of the technical uh, superiority of film over digital uh, was, was short-lived because of that. I'll probably get letters about this, of course. Uh, I, I gave a talk not six months ago uh, digitally, uh, and there was somebody in the audience who shot film, and he had a whole bunch of film questions, and he was just delighted that I didn't, I couldn't answer his film questions. But the, the point is that, that that's not what the talk was about. It wasn't about about film. Anyway, let let's get on. So CCD and CMOS. Here's a, a photo I took uh, a CMOS camera and a CCD camera. I put them next to each other, and I I took a picture of them on my desk. Uh, they look pretty much the same, and 
fundamentally, they do exactly the same thing at the, at, at the most fundamental level. They both have pixels. Uh, like your monitor has pixels, only these pixels collect light instead of giving off light. So they're little bitty tiny buckets that collect photons coming in from outer space, uh, coming from the moon or coming from your deep sky object or, or, or wherever you're pointing your camera. And the, the pixels are collecting or they're counting uh, these photons. And, and sometimes, you know, they miss some photons. They don't necessarily count all the photons that fall on them. We call that quantum efficiency. How many, uh, how much of the light uh, that falls on them actually get detected. And there's noise sources. And we're not going to go into all the different noise sources. That's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother uh, topic. But in general, you know, the basic uh, how do cameras work sort of thing is these pixels are counting uh, photons. And if you don't get a lot of photons, you get a dark area. And if you get a lot of photons, you get a bright area. And so the bright areas have big numbers and the dark areas have little numbers. And when we put that on a computer screen, that's how we make a photograph or an image from camera data. They both work, uh, they, they read out things a little bit differently. Uh, CCDs, uh, will read out, they read out a row, at a, a row at a time. If you've ever seen a movie where the barn's on fire and there's a whole row of people passing a bucket back and forth, that's how a CCD reads out the photons. Uh, the buckets just get passed back and forth through the whole CCD. Uh, each pixel passes the, the, the light or the, the light, it's not really light, you know, the electrons that it, that it, uh, that it collected from the photons. It just passes those numbers, you know, from one pixel to another, and they all get shifted out, and they get amplified, and they get converted to digital, and there's all sorts of electronics that I'm not super qualified to talk about, uh, but the basic idea is, you know, the light gets read off, it gets amplified, and it gets, um, uh, it gets converted into a digital value that you can display on your screen. CMOS, um, and, and, and by the way, too, CCDs were designed initially they were memory chips. Uh, they just happened to be, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's a really interesting story how they figured out somebody discovered that CCDs could be used as an image sensor, but they were initially uh, designed uh, to be um, memory. Uh, and you could, uh, you could, you know, fill all the pixels with different values and then you could read them all out. And that, that was great. CMOS image sensors, on the other hand, were designed to be image sensors from the get-go. Uh, they work by the same basic principle. Light is is hitting this silicon, and it uh, it you know it knocks loose an electron that falls in a little bucket. And uh, the more electrons you have, the more signal uh, you've received on that on that pixel. And the CMOS sensors can read out the data much faster uh, than a CCD. They do make some very very fast CCDs, but for a given clock rate on the chip. Uh, the CMOS has an advantage because it can read out all of the rows or all of the columns uh, at the same time. Also, the CCDs have amplifiers. Each pixel has its own amplifier. So this is sort of in computer speak, uh, this is like uh, parallel processing or like having multiple threads and multiple CPU cores. Uh, you've got all these little processes that can go on per pixel instead of reading them out and applying them to one pixel at a time. And for a given frequency that your electronics are operating, this gives CMOS a, a very, uh, very important uh, speed uh, performance. So let's see, let me read my notes here. All right, so um, if you haven't noticed though, uh, you know, CMOS is the, is the new hotness. Um, and uh, CCD, uh, people want to call it, you know, old bust and CMOS is the new thing. Why, you know, why is this happening? Um, most CCD sensors that we use in astrophotography are made by Sony or OnSimi. Uh, and OnSimi, uh, after being bought, and after being bought, I think, two or three times, uh, it was originally Kodak. It's kind of funny that Kodak sort of invented the CCD sensor. Uh, but their, you know, their management was so stuck in the film way of doing things. Uh, that's also an interesting uh, corporate story how that happened. Um, that's that's again a bunch of curmudgeons, if you if you don't mind my saying, uh, not not able to keep moving forward. Um, and well, the rest is history. Uh, so okay, so we have these two manufacturers that make most of our CCD chips, and Sony's phasing out CCDs within the next five years. They're going all CMOS. 
And on Simi, surprised everyone last year when they said, yeah, we're, we're done. Uh, we're, we're ceasing production uh, next year, which is actually this year, and we're not going to make CCDs. From, from what I've heard on the street, um, they actually can't repair the machines in that factory in New York. Uh, so if, if um, it, they're to a point to where if like, you know, you know the, their, their facility just isn't there uh, to do that. Uh, there are other options. This is not the only two companies that can make uh, CCD chips, uh, but they're very expensive and they're small players and, and they don't, they're not going to be, you never know what the market forces uh, may, may turn about. Uh, but right now they're not um, they're not significant players in, in our market, and in all likelihood they're probably not uh, going to be. So why is this happening? Why why are we um, why what why are we going to CMOS? CCDs aren't good enough. Is it is it just because they're faster? Well, CMOS it is a different manufacturing technology altogether, and it turns out it's much cheaper. Uh, to make a CMOS sensor than it is to make uh, CCD sensors. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that. And I'm sure there's an hour long lecture by somebody in the industry could give on that. Uh, some of it is just economies of scale because of the number of sensors and the market size. And some of it is, uh, you know, from uh, different types of uh, silicon wafers and, and how those are made. Uh, the CMOS sensors are also smaller which enables uh, higher levels of integration. And when I mean smaller, I don't mean like the chip physically is smaller, a smaller image sensor, so you get a smaller field of view. I mean, the electronics are smaller. Instead of having an image sensor surrounded by electronics to, um, you know, to run the camera, you can put more of the electronics right on the image sensor. So there's a much higher rate of integration in this chip than there is uh, with a CCD camera. So it's actually cheaper, again, to build a CMOS camera than it is to build uh, CCD uh, because you have to have less electronic design uh, going on around the chip. As I mentioned before, of course, you can also read out the data much faster and these things, they require less power. Uh, so because of the, the new manufacturing techniques and the newer technology, uh, they just don't draw as much current. So, okay, let me see if I got this straight. They're cheaper, smaller, they do more, and they do it faster, and they draw less power. So it's not really any surprise that everybody is jumping on the CMOS uh, bandwagon, because these are very, very important um, and very, very powerful uh, market forces uh, that, are, that are pushing that forward. And when it comes to, and, and of course, you know, I, all you guys are CCD astronomers, and I'm sure you know, there's somebody on the on the chat board right now going, yeah, but CCDs are still so much better than CMOS. And if only they would do this, they would make some money. And if only they would do this, they would make some money. No. Okay. I, this is the hard truth. Um, nobody cares about us uh, in, in reality. Uh, astronomy is a gnat on the back of a very, very, very large cash cow. Uh, our market is is nothing in comparison to... Uh, just the market for security cameras, all those doorbells with cameras on them now, so you can see who's uh, ringing your doorbell. Uh, all the cameras, you know, that are uh, keeping keeping watch at warehouses and, and those sorts of things, or just the calf, traffic cameras. Uh, even if they're they they're not giving out red light tickets, but those if you've gone through an intersection or you stop at a red light sometime, look around at all the cameras that are pointed at at you. Uh, you know, they're watching and monitoring for, you know, in case there's a traffic accident or somebody gets hit. Um, you know, that, that's a lot of cameras. There are probably more traffic cameras in Lake Mary than they are astronomy cameras in all of the state of Florida. Uh, I mean, just, just not kidding. It, it's a very small, teeny piece of the market. Industrial vision and manufacturing is also very huge. Uh, some of the companies, uh, that make some of our more popular planetary imaging cameras, they they're into, they're, they sell astronomy cameras because they think it's cool. But uh, you know, people like Point Point Grey and um, oh uh, the the one that makes the blue imaging um, imaging source, you know, they make industrial cameras for factories. I mean, uh, you know, 
50 years ago, if you were making, you know, cans of soup and you needed to, you needed to count how many cans of soup came out of your machine, you'd have a little thing and the cans of soup would, would go past it and it would hit a lever or something. Well, that lever moves and it wears out and you can only go so fast because the lever can, is mechanical. Well, now they can set up a high-speed camera and they can pump those cans of soup through there and the high-speed camera is counting soup cans. And that's just a, it's kind of a silly example, but it gives you the idea that by using computer vision uh, to do this, uh, uh, a lot of industrial processes can take place much faster and they can take place with fewer moving parts and fewer failures. And so again, in the grand scheme of things, time is money and all that sort of thing. And that's a very, very large market as well. Uh, a lot of our astronomy camera vendors also uh, do a lot in life sciences. Uh, it's really fun uh, if you get into mic microscopy and photography through a microscope. Uh, it's a lot similar to astrophotography. Uh, they talk about darks and flats and uh, uh, dark current and uh, cooling the sensors and uh, a lot of very similar uh, similar idea ideas and a lot of similar challenges. Of course, they don't have to track uh, something in outer space. Uh, but when it comes to the low level, you know, um, stuff, it's, it, it's also a very big thing. And they also, uh, they also, you know, CCDs are also very big there. Um, and some of the advantages we have in astronomy for CCD also apply to, uh, to life sciences. And of course, let's not forget commercial photography. Uh, I, I've been a Canon uh, photographer longer than I've been an astrophotographer. And, um, you know, the, the local astronomy club here in Orlando is much bigger than my astronomy club is. Uh, there's a lot of people who do, uh, you know, commercial photography or amateurs who do that kind of photography. Canon, uh, you know, when they quit making the 60DA, it wasn't because they didn't want to make astronomy cameras. It was because they quit making the 60D. And they couldn't keep that factory geared to make 60Ds just for the 60DA. Now I'm making the numbers up, but I, I about got the magnitude right. Let's say they made 100,000 60Ds and they'd say, okay, fine. Uh, you know, out of every, you know, 3,000 60, uh, 60Ds, we'll make, you know, a couple of hundred 60DAs. Well, if there's no market for 60Ds because they, they want to introduce the latest greatest, uh, they're not going to keep that up and going just so they can make a few hundred uh, 60DAs a day. And so, you know, in that sense, we're 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 totally beholden to uh, that that other industry. Uh, if that's not enough, automotive. Oh my heavens! I I I couldn't believe this when I read it. I still can't believe it. Uh, a modern automobile has over 60 image sensors. What the heck are they looking at? Uh, I know there's you know the backup camera, so there's one. Uh, but there's image sensors that look and watch all sorts of things in a, in a modern automobile, and that just uh, boggles my mind. Now, these are all big enough, and astronomy is, is nothing uh, in comparison to most of these markets. But then, if all, then we get to that, cell phones. Cell phones, oh my heavens. Um, so uh, the, the last, I was looking, reading a marketing report, they plan to set on, uh, to, to sell 6 billion cell phones in 2020. 6 billion cell phones. That's it, the population of the whole planet was 6 billion, like very recently. That's a cell phone for every man, woman, and child, including babies in the, in the nursery um, in, the, in 20. Now, maybe a lot of people aren't going to sell as many as, uh, as of anything as they thought perhaps in 2020, but it's still, you get the idea. That's a lot of cell phones. And the projected market value is $345 billion. That's not a typo, $345 billion. And, you know, not, not to be too crass about it, but amateur astronomy, we are literally taking table scraps. We're, we're, we're taking the crumbs that fall from the table of these other industries. And these other industries are moving uh, very quickly to CMOS for all of the reasons that I was telling you about uh, in the in the previous slide, and so and that's the way it's always been. Most most of the chips, there's there's not an image sensor that was designed just for astronomy uh, in our market. They're all image sensors, 
Um, I've talked to many camera vendors and, you know, they watch the sensors that are coming out and go, oh, that one would be good for astronomy. Let's build a camera around that. Um, and that's, and that's really how, that's really how it works. Okay, so CMOS versus CCD. Now you understand why it's happening. It's going CMOS. There's, it's a giant tidal wave and your sandcastle is not going to stand up to it. Um, but, okay, so, you know, what does this mean for us uh, moving uh, to, to CMOS? Uh, you know, they, I've, heard, I've been listening for 10, 15 years, for maybe 15 years, people have been saying CMOS is catching up with CCD. And um, it's been true for a while. It, uh, CMOS is still, it's not caught CCD. We're going to talk about some of the advantages. Uh, but that gap is closing uh, very rapidly. And in, in my tenure as an astrophotographer for close to 20 years now, I've seen some, I've seen some changes in CMOS. Uh, and CMOS has already caught CCDs in, term, in a couple of areas that are important, uh, quantum efficiency uh, being one. So QE or quantum efficiency, that's the percentage of, of photons that get detected. Uh, so light, you know, about the, 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 the wave particle duality of light. So if we consider light as photons, little packets of energy that are falling on our pixels, if 100 photons fall on a pixel and the number we read out is 50, uh, you know, neglecting noise and everything else, then you'd say the quantum efficiency was 50%. And if you got 100 photons and you detected 90 of them, then the quantum efficiency would be 90%. So obviously, the higher the quantum efficiency, the, the more sensitive the camera is. 100% would mean it detects every single photon that falls on it. I don't think we'll ever see 100%. Uh, but in the early days of CMOS, uh, CMOS was, did not have very high quantum efficiency compared to CCDs. CCDs just totally won hands down. But today, uh, newer CMOS chips have got quantum efficiencies you know, in the 90s. And uh, back illuminated CCDs, you know, the really good ones also have quantum efficiencies uh, in the 90s. And quite frankly, a back illuminated CMOS with a, you know, a 90 some odd percent QE um, is a lot cheaper than a CCD uh, with the same amount of quantum efficiency. So CMOS is caught, caught up with CCD. I would say they're running neck and neck. I don't think there's any inherent advantage. You can find a chip that has X and X QE. Uh, on either side of the board. So somebody could say, well, I've got a such and such a chip and it's got a 97% QE and, and this other, you know, CCD has 20%. It, don't play that game. I'm talking about in general, the, the, techno, the, the overall technology. Um, in general, CMOS is caught up with CCDs and we can make CMOS chips now that have as much QE as a modern uh, CCD does. Uh, another area where CMOS is caught up is in read noise. Um, now, they've not beat CCD. I see this all the time where the CMOS sensors have such low read noise, and uh, I'll definitely get letters about this, but there's games you can play with the gain on those CMOS chips. The CCD vendors don't do that. They usually fix the gain at whatever the optimal gain is um, for, for, the, for the range of the chip. And the CMOS cameras let you adjust the gain. When you turn up the game, the effective read noise goes down. So you can say our CMOS chip has, you know, one electron read noise. Well, yeah, at a certain gain where you don't have any dynamic range left. Um, but so CMOS is not really that good, uh, but it is pretty good. In fact, I would say CMOS and CCD are about on par today in terms of read noise. If you have a, a, a newer CCD camera, uh, the read noise on that, if, if you compare apples to apples uh, with similar uh, grade chips and things, you're going to get similar read noise performance. And so um, there you go, CMOS and CCD, I, I mean, they're catching up. Well, they've caught up when it comes to quantum efficiency, and they've caught up when it comes to read noise. Uh, the one area where CMOS is always ahead, of course, is readout speed. Uh, we've been able to read out CMOS chips. Uh, much faster than CMOS, and I'll talk about some areas uh, where that's important in a minute. Uh, CMOS is still a little bit behind, but catching up, I, I've seen progress on this just in the last few years. 
I'm going to go through them very quickly and then I'll, I'll go into some more detail about each of them. Uh, but first, there's the full well uh, and the bit depth. So how many electrons per pixel uh, can you collect? Um, and and do you give a, a do you, is your readout a 12-bit readout or, or a 14-bit or 16-bit uh, readout? Uh, Amplo, uh, Amplo is really horrible. You can buy some really uh, cheap CMOS cameras today where the Amplo is really just unusable for deep sky work. Uh, but you can also buy some really good CMOS cameras today where the Amplo is uh, quite well controlled. Pattern noise is also an ongoing problem. Uh, that's going away, uh, but still around. And of course, there's the, the linearity uh, of the chips. So let's deep dive uh, a little bit into some of these things. Uh, when it comes to, uh, say, readout speed, yeah, there we go. So I don't know if this is coming across on your YouTube or not, but this is a looping video of the moon uh, through a high, you know, high magnification, and you can see the moon is bouncing around. So when you're doing this sort of imaging, we call this lucky imaging, uh, you need to take a video and you need to collect many thousands of frames of the moon and you go through there and you're trying to beat the scene. And I'm sure there's some past uh, astro imaging uh, channel talks on lucky imaging on doing the moon and the planets and probably solar imaging as well. And that whole thing started with webcams uh, many years ago. And it's not possible unless you have a high speed camera. Um, I, th I really think the term video camera is a bit of an anachronism. I don't think there's really very many true video cameras in existence anymore. You just have digital cameras, some of which have really fast readout speed. And if you read them out fast enough and you chain them all together, you have a video file. Uh, that's just my, my opinion on that, though. That's, that's definitely not gospel. But this sort of imaging, if you're a lunar or planetary or solar imaging, imager, the readout speed trumps almost everything else. Uh, the moon, the sun, the planets, compared to a deep sky object, there's a huge amount of signal as well. So all these things that we strain about with deep sky stuff, where we're talking about read noise and uh, these, you know, every, trying to get every last uh, ounce of performance we can out of the camera, those things are very well, uh, uh, well, they're negligible when it comes to uh, high light sources. I mean, if you're doing daytime photography with a CMOS camera or even nighttime photography with a security camera and you have an infrared floodlight, there's plenty of signal there to get a good, uh, a good clean image. And so for these types of uh, imaging for, you know, not today, not even last year, it's been a few years now, uh, CMOS has been ruling, uh, you know, supreme. Um, you see these planetary cameras uh, also, and I, and I think the marketing guy is like, but you, can you use them for deep sky? And somebody goes, well, yeah, it's a planetary camera. You could use it for deep sky too. And they want to be able to sell the cameras, but I, very few of them that I found that were actually very suitable for deep sky work. Uh, they're very fast on the readout, but if you try to take very long exposures, uh, some of these other problems we're going to talk about uh, really come to the forefront. and. Um, and become you know more of an issue. So okay, oh, so here's one of my one of my lucky images. This is 0.1 arc second per pixel scale. You can't do that with a deep sky image. The, the atmosphere won't allow it uh, as long as you're on Earth. If the tallest mountain on Earth is not going to get you above the air to take this kind of a deep sky photo, but on you know with lucky imaging you can do that. The other area. Uh, that a lot of people don't understand is the, the importance of having a deep, uh, a, a deep well depth for your pixels, and the bit, the bit depth of the readout of the of the of the camera. So the bit depth and the uh, the full well. What that really means is is what's the biggest number that I can count. So remember the pixels are counting photons, and um, some pixels can count a few hundred photons. Some pixels can count a few thousand photons. Some pixels can count tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of photons. And uh, when you read out the chip, uh, you can read that out as a 12-bit number or a 14-bit number or a 16-bit number. Now, I've spent almost my entire life uh, eating, drinking, breathing, and, you know, bits and computers. And so this is very intuitive to me. But for most people, the difference between a 12-bit number and a 16-bit number is pretty hard to, to understand because well, it's just a number. But um, 
Well, first, let me just say that the higher the bit depth and the deeper the full well, the more electronics you need on the chip and the more expensive they are. So it's very, it's very inexpensive to make a 12-bit chip versus a 16-bit chip. And so there's, there's why there are so many 12 and 14-bit sensors on the market, because they're less expensive to make. But what's the advantage of having a 16-bit chip versus a 12-bit chip? Uh, when you read out the, when you read, you take a picture and you you move the mouse over the pixels, they either go from zero to 65,000. Uh, and if you have a 12-bit sensor, they still seem to go zero to 65,000. If you have a 14-bit sensor, they still seem to go from zero to 65,000. So it's the same range, right? Well, what it is, is those extra bits allow you to kind of chop that light up into smaller, finer and finer grain segments so that you can pull out, uh, you know, fainter, you, all, the, all the really interesting things are going to be very faint down at the bottom of the histogram. And those numbers are going to be very close together. And we need to separate them really well. So an analogy I came up with that seems to work is imagine if, um, if all you had were $100 bills and uh, everything cost a hundred dollars nobody could make change and if you wanted a really nice steak dinner it was a hundred dollars and if you wanted a bottle of dr pepper it was a hundred dollars and if you wanted some bubble gum it was a hundred dollars and if you only had five hundred dollars you're going to go through that five hundred dollars really fast by the time you get you know by the time you ride the bus home for a hundred dollars uh and you have your soda for a hundred dollars and the money is going to go very quickly now imagine that you have five hundred dollars in hundred in one dollar bills though, and uh, now your 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 bubble gum's a dollar, and your soda's two dollars, and your steak dinner's you know forty or fifty dollars, and now that that there's more money to go around because you can sort of divide that up a little bit uh, more finely, and that's sort of what it's like when you go from a twelve bit to a sixteen bit sensor. You have you have the same. You might have the same range from very dark to very bright, uh, but that's because they're just multiplying the numbers out. But really, what comes off the chip is going to be very different. The range is going to be much wider for what comes off the chip. And when you're trying to pick up some very faint signal, uh, and you've got, you know, a faint arm of a galaxy with some different some dust or something in a nebula, uh, and you're trying to pull that apart, it matters. By how fine that separation is, it's even more important for the really faint things, uh, because imagine the lowest. Imagine the lowest number that can be represented as 50. Now I'm going to make the number up. Well, okay, let's say 64. So it's a power of two. If there's any computer people, they're going to be um, they're going to be um, auditing this. So, all right, let's say the lowest number you can read off the chip is 64, and you've you've collected the light from a, a, a galaxy and the number is 40, all right? So that 40 just gets turned into 64. And you've got noise, and the noise is like, you know, 20 or 30, and so then that gets thrown in there. Well, now your noise and your faint signal all get put together, and it's 64. And there's no way you can separate the signal from the noise now down at the bottom. Uh, somebody online was, was saying, that's not true. With an 8-bit camera, you can just stack them. No, if you average 100, if you have, if, if you average a hundred, a hundred times, it's still a hundred, you know, a hundred, 10,000 times, the average is still a hundred. And if you have signal that is below 64 mixed in with noise below 64, it doesn't matter how many 64s you add together. When you divide them by the sum, it's going to be 64. You can't stack that out because you couldn't pull that apart. Um, and we do see, we do see some advances in this. It was really hard to find a 16-bit CMOS sensor. Uh, a few years ago, but there's quite a few 16-bit CMOS sensors now on the market. They're not real cheap, uh, but they are on the market. Also, 14-bit sensors um, are, are more common. But the really, 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 really low-cost planetary cameras, if you can only spend $200 on a, on a CMOS camera, you're probably going to get a 12-bit uh, sensor. And that's okay if you're doing planetary work because uh, it's going to be very bright, and you're not going to have a whole lot of signal lost down in the in the noise. But if you try to do deep sky work with one of those, um, you're going to be very, uh, very, very disappointed. Another area where we're seeing some improvements today is in amp glow. And here's a picture of amp glow. So over here, you know, there's some electronics over here that's that's producing heat, and heat manifests as infrared radiation. 
And uh, that's actually photon. So you're getting photons spewed all over. It's kind of like when the water when the, the, the water sprinklers in somebody's yard is spewing water out onto the sidewalk. Well, that's what's going on here. All these little infrared photons over here getting spewed out and they're spilling on your sensor where you're gonna wanna get this data. It's funny too, because Amplo, originally the term Amplo comes from CCD days because CCDs had an amplifier uh, over here off the side of the chip. I think you can see my mouth, I hope. Uh, so over here are the bright area, off the off the side of the chip, you know, there, that's where the amplifier was, and the amplifier would glow over here. And the CMO, the CCD guys figured out how to defeat that, and uh, you know, you really don't have Amplo in, in CCDs anymore. Well, CMOS does that too, but every pixel on the CMOS has its own amplifier. So we call it Amplo for historical reasons, but it's actually not the amplifier. It's the other electronics around the chip or uh, in the chip off to the side from away from the, uh, from the image sensors. So it's a very similar phenomena, but um, you know, if you wanna you know, pick a fight uh, at, at the next astronomy club meeting, you could be that guy, you know, well, actually it's not the amplifier, it's the other electronics that anyway, um, I digress. And Amplo, Amplo is uh, getting very well contained. Again, the newer, the, again, the newer, more expensive CMOS, that's, that's really the, the name of the game, right? The more you spend, usually the higher quality you get. Um, the newer, uh, the newer, some of the newer CMOS, the uh, Amplo is becoming less and less of an issue. It's still there. There is, um, I was talking to a scientist about a year ago uh, who's doing some very faint, uh, very faint stuff. Um, Dr. Abraham works on the, the dragonfly. And, um, you know, he said there's no CMOS camera on the market that he can use. Uh, even the ones that have, you know, almost no amp glow, he can't use them because he can't calibrate them to the level at which he needs to calibrate them. Now, it'd be interesting to see five years from now if that's still the case. And I think, I'm thinking we're probably five years or less away from he, where he's going to be able to use CMOS sensors uh, for what he wants to do. But we're not there yet, not quite, quite there yet. And I have some CMOS cameras that exhibit amp glow like you see here on the screen, and they're just useless for deep sky. Uh, you can do a dark and it'll sort of subtract it out, but you still get this really mottled mess down in that corner, and you have to do a lot of noise control, and it's it's just not worth it's just not worth the effort uh, on those on those on those chips. And they weren't really designed, they weren't really intended for uh, deep sky work. Just like I said, somebody in marketing says, oh, we should tell people they can use them for deep sky work too. Um, but I, I do have uh, some CMOS cameras uh, that don't exhibit this, and you can do deep sky work with them. So it, it's really hard to make a blanket statement other than CMOS has been plagued by this for years, and it's definitely getting better because there are newer CMOS chips coming out, where this is becoming less and less of a problem. And, and I think it's safe to say that in a, within a few years, it'll be gone completely, uh, even to the, um, the needs of people who are doing very exacting um, scientific measurements. Pattern noise is also um, a problem. This is like my worst, um, one of my biggest pet peeves personally. Uh, one of my pet projects is uh, live stacking with extremely short exposures. And the pattern noise on some of these low, low cost CMOS sensors uh, is very bad. In this image, this is two, two darks, uh, actually it's two biases taken from the same camera uh, next to each other. And then I just lined them up next to each other. And you can see the lines, you know, they don't match. So here in the middle, there's kind of a seam. And that's because this pattern noise, these lines are bouncing up and down every time uh, you take an image and those lines don't calibrate out. You can't, you can't subtract a big giant master bias that gets rid of those because they're different on every frame. So you can do a whole bunch of biases and you can take a whole bunch of images and uh, hopefully they'll smooth out when you, when you, um, when you stack enough of them. Uh, but that's a shame because you could probably get away with a lot fewer images stacked with a CCD. And again, this is something that was really, really bad uh, five years ago, and it's still really bad on your, you know, your really, really budget CMOS cameras, but it is getting better. 
Uh, you don't see this as much on the, um, you know, the more extensive CMOS cameras. You don't see this much. You don't see this at all on, on a modern DSLR. Uh, you know, for example, DSLRs are CMOS, uh, but yeah, the Sony and Canon and Nikon, they've, they've got CMOS figured out. In some ways, I think the astronomy CMOS community is still catching up with uh, where the DSLR uh, research and development uh, has gotten them. Uh, the last, uh, the last area where, uh, CMOS is still catching up and, uh, you know, is still making some strides is in linearity. And sometimes you can sort of ignore linearity. Sometimes, uh, you can, you do so at your own peril. Um, now this is a, a math equation. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping a lot of people are overwhelmed by this, but it, this is the equation of a line, a straight line. And a linear response means, this actually, by the way, is one of the great things about digital imaging over film. And I don't remember John C. Dvorak talking about this, but if you, if you drop twice as much light into a sensor, you should get twice as much signal. And that was not the case with film at all. Uh, film was really, really very, very nonlinear. Uh, but image, CCD image sensors are, uh, are very linear. Uh, we lose a little bit of linearity on the CCD when we add anti-blooming gates uh, so that we don't get those, I should have put a picture in here, what blooming looks like. But what happens is if a, a pixel overflows with electrons, the pixels flow, um, the electrons flow into the next pixel. And so again, like the, if they're buckets of water, you pour too much water and the water splashes out and it goes into the other pixel. Uh, most of us uh, doing pretty picture astrophotography uh, we don't like that. We want to get rid of that. And so they, they put some extra circuitry in the, in the chip to kind of drain that excess light. So at the very top of the, of the chip's capability, uh, you, you get a little bit of nonlinearity. But that's not, most of the range of the chip is still, uh, is still very linear. So we get a nice straight line. So here's an example of not a straight line, uh, just a, a random curve here. Uh, where it's a little slow to start and then it kind of goes up. It looks kind of, it's, even this is still sort of linear through most of its range. And as long as you expose up in here, you're going to get fairly, uh, fairly good performance. Um, here's like where it's kind of a slow start and that. And these are just example curves showing what nonlinearity looks like. This is an actual measurement. Now, this was a uh, particular CMOS. Uh, camera being evaluated uh, by um, my, one of my peers at Software Best, the systems engineer. And so she was measuring uh, the camera's response. And this is the signal being fed to the camera. And then the Y axis is the uh, signal being reported. And you can see right here, there's a nice, wow, you give them a little more signal, there's a big jump in the number. And then look at this range here. You can incre you're increasing the signal, more light falling on the sensor. And it doesn't budge. You get exactly the same number. And then all of a sudden it jumps up and then it's kind of flat again. And then it jumps up and it's flat again. And then it sort of smooths out up here. And there's all sorts of very complicated reasons for why this happens. But what, hap what this means is, you know, you've got some area in here where you can't really be sure how much signal you actually received because your sensor's not really reporting it very accurately. Well, does this really matter? If I just want to take a picture of the moon or a picture of the planet, I'm probably going to have some bright light up in here and a very faint object, you know, as long as I get up in here, uh, I'm going to be able to see the details and I'm going to fix it all in processing. And some people would rather spend hundreds of hours processing than thousands of dollars on a better camera. And, and I understand that trade-off, a, a lot of people have to make it. But there are some areas where this, this catches up with this uh, if you're trying to do uh, photometry, I really hate it when people say it has no scientific value. Almost everybody I hear say that they don't understand. They're not actually scientists. So usually, I'll get letters for this. But you know, they're hobbyists who think of themselves as scientists. A real scientist will talk about qualitative and quantitative data and different types of uh, scientific data for different types of purposes. And so, something that has no value for one type of science has tremendous value for other types of science. Um, and, um, well, let's not get out too far on that soapbox, but if you're doing photometry, this is a very particular type of science where you're making a very particular type of, of measurement. That's very important. 
uh, if there's a supernova in this galaxy, I need to know how bright that supernova is. And so what we do is there's a star over here, and I'll look this star up in a star catalog, and I know how bright that star is. And then I measure this and I see how bright this is. Now you have to calibrate this. You're gonna have to subtract the dark. Um, you're gonna have to, you may potentially have to do a flat field, depends on where they are. But if this is properly calibrated, the ratio of this brightness uh, should be you should be able to use the ratio of this brightness to figure out how bright that star over there is. But what if the sensor is not linear? Well, if it's if it's this picture and the star you're looking at and the star you're using are here and here, you're going to be pretty close. And you might even argue that you know even if one of them is down here, it's still going to be fairly close. But it's not going to be exact. And if you if if your measurements are you know 10% off of somebody else's measurements and they're using a CCD and you're using a CMOS, um, you're probably gonna, they're probably gonna give the credit to the CCD guy because his, his measurement is probably uh, going to be uh, slightly better. The other area where um, uh, nonlinearity can get in the way is when we shoot flats. Now I know a lot of people don't like to shoot flats. Uh, they like to use um, the tools in Photoshop to do, uh, you know, get rid of vignetting, or they'll use dynamic background extraction uh, to get rid of uh, uh, vignetting. So you still need those tools because you're going to get gradients from sky pollution and all sorts. There are all sorts of things that will add gradients to your image. But uh, a flat field corrects all sorts of things. Not only does it correct uh, vignetting, but it also gets rid of these uh, these little dust bunnies. Uh, these are, are shadows of tiny rings of uh, dust uh, on the uh, cover plate of the sensor or on the filter wheel. They're all the same in here, so you can say, you know, my all my filters have the same pattern. Well, that means it's not on the filter wheel. It means it's on the little cover plate uh, right up close to where the sensor is. And that that's a very, um, you know, that's a very unsightly uh, visual effect we want to get rid of. And flat fields calibrate that out for us uh, and, and allow us to get a nice uh, evenly illuminated image and to get rid of those. And it's very hard to shoot flat. Uh, in, you know, in the, in the list of things when you're becoming an astrophotographer, learning to polar align, for me, I have to admit, many years ago, God bless, I couldn't polar align to save my life for, uh, for quite a while. And uh, I finally got the hang of it. Now I don't know why it was so hard, but it was a tough thing. And I still, people have problems with different things. And one that I see a lot is people can't get their flats to work correctly. And a lot of times it's with a CMOS camera. And, uh, and I wonder how much of that's because their flats, their, you know, their, their darks and their biases and their flats aren't really calibrating very well because the cameras are doing, you know, crazy things uh, internally to, to the numbers. Because this is just a simple math equation. And when you use a CCD, the math works. And when you use a CMOS, it might work. Uh, it's, it's sort of up in the air. And of course, you know, not, don't get me wrong, this is also improving. There's a paper I found recently in a physics journal on the nonlinearity of CMOS sensors. And uh, the author felt uh, he had this way of this is how we can make CMOS uh, behave more uh, linearly. And so, you know, the people who are making CMOS, they're aware that they're not linear and that they're aware that there are markets where that linearity is very important and they are working on that. And they're being funded by all the people with cell phones and traffic cameras and, and so forth. Uh, but they are working on that. I had a nice conversation, I've had a couple of conversations with another uh, colleague about software ways to sort of characterize a sensor um, and determine its nonlinearity and use that as a lookup table to sort of relinearize uh, some of the data uh, to make some of this work right. So there are software fixes people are thinking about and there are hardware fixes think people are thinking about. And um, this is a temporary problem. Uh, rest, you know, don't be, you can be assured this is a very temporary, very temporary problem. So, Really, what has Richard said today? He's, you know, he really didn't say CCDs are better than CMOS. Well, he sort of did, but it sort of depends on what you're working on and and what you're doing with it. Um, it's it's really like steak versus hamburger. Um, who, you know, generally, 
you consider steak to be a better meal than a hamburger, right? But who hasn't had a lousy steak? And who hasn't had a really amazing hamburger? Which of these is going to be the better meal? It depends on how hungry you are. Uh, it depends on how much money you have. And it depends on where you are and what's available. Uh, it also depends on how long you're willing to wait. Uh, do you want to drive through and get something wrapped in paper and, and eat it while you drive down the highway? Or do you have time to sit down uh, to a nice milk meal? And so really, it, it's CCD versus CMOS is a lot like that. There's some really good CCD cameras on the market. There are also some real dogs. And there are some really good CMOS cameras on the market. And there's surely also some real dogs. And you can't, if you look at two cameras, you go well, one CMOS and one CCD, and you go, well, I'm going to buy that because it's CCD and CCD is better. You just made a mistake uh, because you need to know why that camera's CCD is better than the other camera's CMOS because that may not be true. You may, you may get better results from a particular CMOS camera versus a particular uh, CCD camera. The, the, they're definitely, um, they, they've not quite caught up, but they're getting close. And the gap is the gap has closed considerably just in the last few years, and I think that we're really uh, we're at that we are at the sunset of CCDs where we're only a few years away. Where I'm not going to be talking about nobody's going to be talking about Amplo anymore, and people aren't going to be talking about uh, nonlinearity. Oh, unless you got the, one of those old ZWOs from five years ago. Yeah, those things aren't nonlinear. We know about that. But if you got some, you know. I, I really think that that's um, that that's that's where we're going. And actually, that's all. So I'll turn off my screen share and submit myself. Okay, Rich. Welcome back. Questions and answers. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Um, I, that was excellent. I, you know, usually we run fifty to sixty people. Uh, you were, I think I saw 127 at one point tonight. It was a topic, not me. <laughs> uh, don't be too sure. Um, yes. I, I don't, and, and the people from Central Florida seem to be very well behaved. They've Yay, been, thanks, you know, guys. Comments, so uh, I'm sure you'll you'll get them at the next meeting if there ever is another in-person meeting, right? They're, they're, they're a nice group. They're all a nice I know. group. I know, yeah. and I appreciate them. Um, Eric, did you see any questions over there? Uh, there's a lot of chatter over there. I didn't see any questions, but I have a question for you, Richard. I'm a deep sky astrophotographer, or anyone's a deep sky astrophotographer. And we're just in the market for a new camera, and we have a reasonable budget. What do we buy? Oh, gee. I mean, isn't that the, the $64,000 question? It, it is. It is. And, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, I get, I, get, I get a little squeamish about doing hardware. hardware. I don't want to, like, recommend specific hardware. Actually, I guess I don't mind recommending specific hardware. What I don't want to do is say don't buy, don't buy this or don't buy that. Um, so well, I have uh, – Brands is fine. Forget about the brands. If we have, let's say that we have 10 grand to invest in a new camera, we yeah. already have filters, what do we do? The, I, t I tell you, the, the two best, the three best cameras I own um, is uh, a Canon DSLR because, and I really think like the highest quality CMOS you can buy today is a DSLR. Uh, other than cooling, they are, they're very good, full frame, low noise, you know, a new a new modern DSLR. I just reviewed the uh, the EOS R A, and it's it's really a, a quite quite good uh, CMOS cam uh, camera. My two favorite cameras are both CCD cameras. Uh, one is the Sony six nine four. Um, I just got a, a pro package upgrade for it, so the read noise is only about two or three electrons. So the Sony six nine four has a quantum efficiency of like seventy seven percent. And I only have a couple of electrons of read noise. And it's just a fantastic uh, image sensor. Um, it's small, so it's not, you know, it's smaller than APA C. Uh, but, you know, I have, if, if you have over a dozen telescopes, you just change the focal length and you still get whatever field of view you want. Uh, but that 694 is, um, 
that CCD is just a really, really good uh, sensor. My other favorite camera is the 16200, uh, also a CCD. And I've seen some really promising, new, exciting CMOS cameras, 16-bit, no amp glow, high QE. Um, I haven't seen anything I'd trade that 16200 for. Um, you know, to be honest, I haven't shot with a real expensive CMOS camera. Um, yeah, well, that's not entirely true either. Uh, but I, I think my two favorite my two favorite cameras today for deep sky work is the 16200. It's the FLI microline and um, the uh, Tria 694 from Starlight Express. Uh, I've got a little bug flying around here um, in the Pro package, with, so it has much lower read noise. So those two are my favorite. Those two are my favorite cameras, and I've won contests and and APOD and uh, you know those those cameras just don't uh, don't let me down. Uh, CMOS wise, you know I've I've got a collection of ZWO and QHY CMOS cameras, um, and and I I think they're great. I shoot the moon with them. Uh, I I've done a little bit of solar and planetary work with them, and and they work great for that. You don't need a CCD for for those types of um, those types of markets. The only the only CMOS I have liked for deep sky work is when I'm doing really wide field deep sky work with a camera lens, nightscapes, uh, or um, maybe uh, plug it into a 200 millimeter camera lens, that sort of thing. I'm gonna kill that bug. <laughs> Did that is that does that address your question? Um, well, I'm not in the market for a camera, but it's something you think about. Like, what do I do next year? What do I do the year after when my 16200 is getting a few years on it? What do I do? Right. That's right. the question that we're all. I mean, anyone that's going to buy a camera is scratching their head going, what oh, do I do? I, I can't tell you. Uh, two years from now, there's no telling what this will look like. Um, I've seen in the last in the last two years, I've seen Amplo um significantly improved um and i think uh the linearity is is the linearity i showed you was on a on a really you know a 200 dollar cmos camera uh i think the linearity is being addressed as well i i two years from now who knows who knows what if you're in the market right now um i would probably still buy a ccd because they're they're still available you can get uh, the Sony CCDs are going to be available for another five years. So uh, if you don't need a large chip, that 694 is going to be a really great chip for years to come. Um, and then, you know, if it goes bad, you can buy another one. Uh, 16200, five years from now, that may be a hard chip to find. Alex, you got any questions? Uh, we can't hear you, Alex. Nope. Alex? Uh, we lost Alex's audio. Yeah, I, I'm not hearing him either. I see his mouth moving. Well, anyway, I mean, I'm looking over at the uh, the YouTube. I can't remember right. at any time when we've had 135 people watching. <laughs> yeah, so. Um. Am I back? You got everyone's attention. Yes, you are. Okay, um, Eric, would you go ahead and read the um, read through the questions that are coming in at the end? And I would suggest that anybody that does have questions, uh, obviously, we're winding up pretty soon here. So um, get your questions in as much as you can. So, Eric, you go ahead and review those questions. There's a couple of, of uh, in the thread earlier. Um, KC2YYF huh? asked asked a couple of times, uh, a couple of questions here that I, I don't know if we can answer them during this session, but I wanted to recognize them and advise that if you have some of these questions, they might better be answered by, uh, first off, I recommend everybody um, get a guru in your local club if you can. The, if you're in Central Florida, I know of a very good club there. So you go go there. And if you're on Riverside, come on out here. But the point being is is get a guru because it is so much easier explaining these things in, in person. Um, then 
Um, and also someplace along the line, Richard had made a statement about something. And then um, one of the comments was, oh, don't tell me that such and such can't take a really good picture. I never heard Richard saying anything like that. Richard, you may want to make a comment to that, you know, to explain that every camera used properly can take a fine picture. Um, and absolutely, and, and absolutely. And I, I, worth of can go, go ahead, Richard. You're the yeah, person. yeah. There's, there's. Um, I'm absolutely not going to tell you that such and such camera can't take a good picture. Uh, one thing I don't know, I don't know that camera unless I've used it itself. It's one of the points I was trying to make is you can't say that uh, all C. I, I I have two favorite CCD chips, so you can't say all CCDs are better than all CMOS. And and a lot of times, you know, as an engineer, one of the things we go through in you know in training to be an engineer is design trade off. Uh, just because you can measure a difference doesn't mean the difference is important. And a lot of times we look at these sensors and we look at these spreadsheets and we see these numbers and like, well, this one is better than this one. But out in real world conditions, you get a very nice, you get, you still get a very nice image. It depends a lot on what your imaging goals are. Uh, if you, if you talk to anybody, a salesman who's going to sell you a camera, do not buy a camera from anybody that doesn't ask you two questions first. One, what do you want to take photos of? Are you doing deep sky? Are you doing emission? Are you into, into galaxies? Are you doing nightscapes? The second question is, what kind of telescope do you have? Or what kind of telescope do you, do you want to put this on? Because matching a camera to a telescope is very, very important uh, as well as what you're trying to take pictures of. And even if you just say, I want to do science, what kind of science do you want to do? Do you want to do, are you, do, are you looking for supernova? Are you doing variable stars? Or, uh, you know, there are a lot of different scientific things that you could be measuring with these cameras. And different cameras are going to have different performance metrics that make those things uh, stand out better. So ultimately, you know, I, I do not get into the, to, to, you know, to, to games where it's like, well, I've got, it's a steak versus hamburger thing. Well, my steak is better than your hamburger. Well, who's to say, you know, my, I've seen, like it's, I've seen some pretty awesome hamburgers and I've had some pretty lousy steaks. Uh, so, you know, I would never, I would never say, well, your steak, your, your hamburger stinks compared to my steak. Uh, definitely not. So I hope I addressed that well enough. How are we doing, Eric? Uh, you know, I've looked over, there's lots of discussions. I didn't really see any outstanding questions. Down at the, down at the bottom, there's some questions about photometry. Um, uh, are there, hold on one sec. Let me, let me... Okay. Uh, could you talk about binning, please? Oh, there was a question about binning. Ah, binning. Okay, actually, that's um, that's a very good point. I should have put that on my slide. Um, on a CCD chip, when you bin, it combines uh, one pixel with the neighboring pixel. So you, if you have two by two pin uh, binning, it uh, you get four pixels summed together, so you get sort of a super pixel. Three by three binning means you get a three by three or nine pixels that all get added together. And when you do that on a CCD chip, you get a read noise advantage. So that read noise is this electronic kind of bouncing in the signal. So you may have a number, say the number is 50. And by the time it gets off the chip, the number may be 52 or the number may be 48. And that bouncing around is the electronic read noise. And when you bend, uh, it reduces the amount of read noise. Uh, that's probably, it's, I'm glossing over it a little bit for any electronic engineers there. But when you bend, you get a read noise advantage. CMOS sensors cannot bend. Oh, but my CMOS camera bends. Stop. No, it, the software bends. Uh, or they, or they may be implementing that in this, in the camera firmware, but the sensor cannot bend. Uh, it cannot sum those pixels out and read them out. Now you can read out that data and you can do a software bin or you, and whether you do that in firmware or you do that in your, you know, the Sky X, for example, will bin your DSLR. It just reads the raw DSLR and it adds, it sums the pixels up and you get a monochrome image like you were binning, but you don't get that read noise advantage. And so there with a CCD, you can take a very short, highly binned image and you can make sure you're on your target because you can see it very well. 
With the CMOS, you take a very short image and you bin it. You still may get some of that effect, but you're not going to get over the read noise nearly as, as effectively as you do with the CCD. And that is a technical challenge that probably will never go away uh, because the binning is just, it's just in the, har the architecture of the way CCDs work. The CMOS can't bin. Now, if the read noise is low enough, it may be a negligible difference. Um, but currently, you know, it's not. Is so, there any difference between pixel size between uh, CMOS and CCD? Any inherent not, differences? Uh, no, you can get CCDs with very small pixels. You can get CMOS with very small or very large pixels. Um, I, I will say about pixels, I think people obsess over small pixels to their detriment. Larger pixels are much more sensitive to light and you usually get a little bit of a, uh, a noise advantage from large pixels over smaller pixels. Now, a camera's electronics, you may have a $5,000 DSLR with very small pixels and very low noise, but uh, also don't be fooled. DSLRs don't give you the raw data off of that sensor. Uh, they, do, they do stuff to that, you know, to that data. Um, but in, in general, I like larger pixels better than I like smaller pixels because of the um, the more sensitivity. Uh, but that doesn't matter. CCDs and CMOS, it's a choice. Um, if they're on equal footing there. You can get CMOS with larger small pixels. Same for CCD. Richard, uh, Rich does binning increase the well depth or does it remain the same? Uh, it depends on the sensor. Uh, it does in, on almost all CMOS, on almost all CCDs, it does increase the well depth. But some of them, like the 8300, um, the well depth uh, is not big enough to hold four really highly charged pixels. And you can actually get blooming. When you bend two by two on an 8300, you sort of get a fake bloom. If you've got a really bright star, um, the readout register isn't big enough to hold all of that data. And so you don't get quite quite the benefit. I don't know of any of the other chips when you when you bloom or the readout registers aren't big enough, but you do get a little bit more full well effectively uh, when you bend. With CMOS, you're doing it in software, so there's no limit because it's software. Um, you can hold as big a number as you want. So this might not be a fair question, but considering the low cost of a CMOS chip. Do you think that that's going to be reflected in the price of a CMOS camera eventually? Or is the market going to dictate price? Uh, most of the value when you buy a camera, most of what you're paying for is the chip. The chip is the most expensive thing. Uh, in, in fact, there are um, uh, like FLI, for example, it, say you have an old Apogee camera and you've got a really expensive sensor in it and Apogee's not servicing the cameras anymore, blah, blah, blah. You can send your camera to FLI and they'll take the chip out of that camera and put it in an FLI body. And um, it's very, very cost effective to do that because the chip is really what costs the, uh, the most, the, the, mark, the, 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 the bulk of the cost of your camera is the chip itself, the image sensor, not the electronics around it. So you think that CMOS cameras will eventually be lower priced and CCDs? Uh, things being equal, which of course they're not. It, it, it's like saying our cars going to be less expensive, than, our trucks going to be less expensive than, than cars. It depends on what car and what truck. I can buy a pickup and I can buy a Porsche or a Lamborghini. Um, I don't think that's. I don't think that that is a technology question. I think there are going to be expensive CMOS sensors, and there are going to be cheap CMOS sensors, and I don't think that's ever going to change. There's always going to be cheap CMOS sensors, and there's always going to be really expensive CMOS sensors. Just as the as the technology moves forward, the really high capability it'll be. You know, 16-bit CMOS sensors will be much cheaper. You know, down the road. What's really going to be interesting is how many more years before we have virtually no read noise and virtually 100% quantum efficiency? I mean, the QE is already in the 90s. We get to 98, 99% quantum efficiency and we get to less than one electron read noise. What's left? Cameras are as sensitive as they can possibly be. 
it's, it'll make processing just a bit easier though, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I think processing is going to get more interesting. I think um, computational photography is going to find its way into astrophotography and it's going to, it's going to change the way we do things. That's a whole nother soapbox. <laughs> By the way, you're getting more and more popular. We now have 155 people in the room. In the... What, are these, what are these people showing up for? Yeah, that must not... be my Hawaiian shirt. They, they keep Hawaiian showing shirt. up with one, 157. Um, and hey, Richard, we got a couple of people, Sergio and uh, Barbara, I think it is, asking about uh, specific applications of, um, of, um, of photometry. And uh, Sergio says that he's got a small CCD and a large new CMOS, and he's going to do, um, he's, he'll probably go CCD, he says. And then one of the questions is, do you know of any CMOS capable of doing photometry? Now, before you answer that, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what Barbara wants to know. Um, Barbara says that she, linear, linearity is very important, of course. And uh, what other CMOS factors besides um, linearity should she be concerned about? And then, uh, yeah, and I think those are the two related to photometry. Maybe you can answer those. Is that Barbara Harris? Yes. Ah, hi, Barbara. She's also in my club. She's uh, a big, uh, somewhat well-known variable star observer, actually. Okay, so the first question, do I know of any CMOS sensors that can do photometry? Um, the answer is yes because I didn't know it, but Barbara uh, came and gave a talk at our club once about doing photometry with the DSLR. And um, so people do, do do photometry with CMOS. I think, you know, the amount of linearity, um, it depends on the, you know, I would say your $200 CMOS camera is not gonna do a very good job. It'll probably get you in the ballpark. It, it really depends on how fine you want those measurements uh, to be. And I mean, to give you a, a, an honest answer, if you have a CMOS and you have a CCD, you should characterize both of them and see how linear they are and make sure they're linear over the range you're interested in. Your CMOS, for example, may be nonlinear at very low signal and may get be very linear at high signal. And as long as you expose long enough, you're always going to be in that linear range and it should work. It should work just fine. Um, to Barbara's question for CMOS, what else should you be worried about other than linearity for photometry? Um, I would say uh, the um, the pattern noise could potentially be a bit of an offset. Um, one thing that worries me is I have I have I have seen some CMOS cameras where when you do a dark um, at a certain temperature. And then another time, a week later, you take more darks at the same temperature. And the, the values of those two darks are very, very different. Like they could be two or even three times different. Say, uh, I'm measuring my dark in the 80s or in a thousand. And then the next week I'm measuring my darks at the same temperature in the 80s, 80s or in three or 4,000. Now the only thing, as, as an engineer, as a software engineer, not a hardware engineer, the only thing I can guess is this is the electronics in the camera being initialized uh, differently. It's just cheap electronics. And so I would say if you're doing photometry with the CMOS, I would collect my darks uh, at the same time that I collect my data, uh, just so that the circuitry is the same. And to be fair, um, down at my uh, uh, dark sky camp where I, where I used to go in, in Okeechobee, we had very, very poor power. And the, the noise, the power, the AC power was very noisy. And at a CCD camera, and my darks at home and my darks taken down there looked different. I mean, you could see the difference. Uh, just there was patterns in it from the quality of the power going into the camera. And so I, I would take my darks while I was down there, and I would calibrate those images with those darks. Um, and I've seen that more, though, in CMOS cameras all things being equal where the darks uh, can be uh, can be very different. And so I would always do the darks at the same time. Other than that, I can't think of anything else that would get in the way of, you know, proper got calibration. A, got another Go question ahead. pop up. Uh, you think there's any difference between mono and color CCD versus 
uh, CMOS? Um, not as far as CMOS versus CCD goes. Uh, there's no inherent difference between CMOS and CCD for color and, and, and mono. The, the main difference between color and mono is, um, you know, the Bayer matrix on a color sensor doesn't let as much light through. So a mono sensor with a, you know, a, a filter wheel, you'll actually get more light on the pixels than you will with a color chip. And so you get more signal with the monochrome. Uh, and, and I did an experiment. I actually have a color um, 694 and I have a black and white monochrome 694. So the same chip in two cameras, same manufacturer too, they're both Starlight Express. And on a given night, uh, I, I took some exposures of the Horsehead Nebula and then I put on the, the mono with the filter. And I took three color images and averaged them together. And I took one red, one green, one blue, uh, the same length of time as the color images. And my one red exposure, one green exposure, one blue exposure, when I combined those, I had less noise than I did with the three images taken with the color. Um, and that's another lecture, but it's about signal to noise and 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 uh, math and physics. There's there's no point in debating. People, you know, you can interpolate it all you want. You can sort of spin it all you want, but you get better signal to noise with the mono sensor uh, than you do with the color sensor. Now that's with the same chip, the same exact CCD mono versus color. That's not to say that if you have a very sensitive color CMOS chip and a very old monochrome CCD chip that that new color CMOS can't outperform that old monochrome CCD. So again, it's it's steak and hamburger. You can't make that blanket state. I can make a blanket statement that color is uh, mono is better than color if they're the same sensor. But if they're not the same sensor, you know, especially if they're not the same optics, um, then you can't you know, that's, that's not going to be the same. You put the mono on an F10 and put the color on an F3 or an F2 optic, and you're going to blow away the mono uh, in that situation as well. But it's not an inherently CMOS versus CCD thing at all. Okay, Richard, um, Larry Groom, and I, I need to mention that name because Larry likes it when his name gets <laughs> I remember Larry, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, Larry's a good guy. Uh, he wants to know if you know of any CMOS cameras with a shutter. My DSLR. <laughs> I hate, I hate that nobody puts shutters on these cameras. I hate it. I've talked to camera vendors. The shutters, uh, one, my, a good friend of mine, you know, owns a, a company and he's one of the owners. And I'm like, oh, put shutters on it. The number one point of failure, the shutter's a moving part and the shutters fail. But it makes it a real pain in the neck when you want to shoot darks. You know, and even in our own software in the sky, if you want to shoot a dark, it says cover the telescope so I can shoot a dark. What a pain in the behind. Um, we do have a feature where you can put a dark uh, filter so you can put a dark filter in the filter wheel and it'll move to the dark filter. But yeah, that it'll do in a pinch, but there's nothing like having a, a shutter on the camera, especially if it's remote. Or your your cameras get you're gonna leave your camera on the telescope. I mean, if it's a refractor, sure, but maybe you've got a Newtonian and it's open, and now your camera sensor is just open to the elements all the time, and you just want a shutter to close across that. Um, the well, FLI, I think the that's FLI, that. yeah, yeah. I was about to say the Kepler has a shutter on it, doesn't it, Tony? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, the, it, FLI will let you put a shutter on any camera. Excellent. Well, there you go. Get one from okay. FLI, they put a shutter on it for you. But yeah, it always said daylight to me that there's no shutter on most on a lot of these newer cameras. Okay, yeah. listeners, um, I want, you know, if you've had a question and for some reason we haven't addressed it, please retype it at this point because this, this question list has gotten awfully long. So retype it down there so we don't miss out on you. Um, when you earlier talked about big size, uh, big pixels and small pixels, and uh, Richard, would you uh, tell us what your dividing line between big and small is or, or how you compare oh, those? Yeah, yeah. So funny story, I was at an observatory and um, professional astronomers over there talking and he's like in earshot. He says, I love that 16803. It's got those little teeny tiny nine micron pixels and it's just so awesome. 
<laughs> and it just made me laugh because in for in us for us nine microns is gigantic that's an enormous pixel and uh, i remember when i was talking to somebody else and i said well i want something with big pixels he says like you know like 24 or 30 and i'm like no like nine he goes nine that's not big um it, yeah it's very funny how professionals I mean, it, it, it makes sense because you've got these gigantic telescopes with really long focal lengths. And when we talk about astrophotography and compare, matching a camera to your telescope, it's the pixel scale. We want to shoot at about, you know, rarely do we want to go much less than an arc second per pixel or half an arc second per pixel based on your scene. Well, the same applies to everybody, even if you're a professional astronomer. If you've got 40,000, you know, millimeters focal length, you know, you can't shoot at a tenth of an arc second per pixel. So you need a camera with really, really big pixels for those really big pixels. Um, but for me, uh, big pixels, I think larger pixel starts around six. So anything five or six or up, I would prefer over two or three. I would not do deep sky work with a two or three pix uh, or, um, two or three what? Um, microns. Two or three micron pixel, I would not use for deep sky work with any of my uh, telescopes. I would use them for the moon uh, or the planet. Doing lucky imaging, you can get away with that. But I would rather, yeah, you six, know, you know, five point six three. I think one of them, um, I think sixteen two hundred, something like that. It's just shy of six, uh, six microns. Richard uh, Barbara was asking, is there any difference in cooling between a CMOS and a CCD? Um, actually, there is. Uh, CMOSs generate more heat than CCD cameras do. Uh, so they get hotter faster. Uh, so in general, uh, a lot of C CMOS sensors uh, build up um, dark current faster than CCDs do. Now, I say that because it's mostly true today. Who's to say three or four years from now if that'll be true or not? Uh, but right now, I think it's a safe bet to say uh, really long exposures, that's, that's actually another advantage over CCD, really long exposures, uh, CCDs win, uh, win on that front as well. And somebody asked, uh, Roy asked about your thoughts on an IMX455 CMOS chip. Hmm? No? No, no. That, um, one, of the, one of the questions from uh, uh, I think it's John Grief um, asks, um, uh, and I've lost it. Uh, oh, what, what, what's happened with this um, mirrorless stuff? How's, how come it's replacing DSLR? What's what's the story behind it? Oh, you should. You, can I plug my? I just did a talk last weekend on the mirrorless EOS cameras for um, Woodland Hills. They didn't do it as part of these. They did it sort of at the same time. But if you go to the Woodland Hills YouTube channel, I did a talk on the EOS R and RA. And um, basically, it, 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 my first impression was I didn't like it uh, because it was different. Um, and then after about a week, I got used to it. And then I realized how much better it was. So it's one of those things where it's hard to change from what you know. Um, and then, then once you once you realize that actually this is better, uh, it's it's pretty nice. So the mirrorless it works the same way a DSLR does. You can you can interchange the lenses. Uh, you can even use the same lenses. They make adapters. Uh, it's just basically a little spacer that you need to put in there. Um, and there's no mirror that pops up. So the, you get rid of mirror lock. You get rid that the inside is actually opened up, so you have less vignetting. Um, if uh, uh, I've got F3 optic, really, really narrow cone coming down. And on my 5D Mark III, for example, um, the box is so, the, the sensor is so far back in there, the light cone actually intersects the front of the camera before it gets to the sensor. And I get some really deep shadowing uh, around my object. And you'll get that, you won't get that with the mirrorless because they're much op more open and the sensor is much closer to the, to the front of the camera. The LCD preview, I didn't think I would like that either because I like being able to see what I'm looking at. But the simulation of depth of field, um, I can see the Milky Way with it. Doing my nightscapes, I can look through the viewfinder and I can see the Milky Way. So if I want to line the Milky Way up with some palm trees or something, I can literally do that looking through the telescope, uh, looking through the viewfinder. 
Um, and that's, you know, an improvement on their noise, or I'm not sure how they're doing that, but my old camera didn't do that on the LCD. It didn't get that kind of a uh, quality enhancement. So I actually, my, I guess in short, I like the, I like the mirrorless uh, cameras. I didn't like them at first because they were different and I was being a curmudgeon. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is actually pretty nice. Give it a chance. I guess we're all afflicted with the curmudgeon gene now and again, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Someone, uh, John asked, does the one to two arc, sec arc second per pixel rule still apply with CMOS? It's the same rule no matter what kind of sensor you're using. It, it, it depends on the seeing um, your local conditions. You know, here in Florida, we have very good seeing. Out west, Every time I come to visit you guys out west, it's like, oh, it's so dark and so clear and so transparent. And the thing is just horrible compared to what we get here in Florida. So it depends on which side of the mountains you live on and what your elevation is and all that sort of thing as to what your pixel scale should be. But that's that's about physics um, and the size of the pixels. It doesn't matter whether it's CMOS or CCD. Okay, Richard, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, it was great. I, I thank you. put a message in over there that says, uh, that's enough questions for tonight, guy. <laughs> we got we to gotta have an excuse to invite Richard back. So, uh, okay. Richard, you know anything more that you could talk about at some point? Oh, I might. Oh, wait a minute. There I'm... was one that was already there. Bisque Fusion. Is that something yeah. You know about? Yeah, I could talk about that sometimes. Yeah. That. And no more questions, folks. We'll just have to have Richard back sometime. Okay. okay. But, uh, tell us about uh, oh, you, oh. You a whole session on BISC Fusion. Oh, I could do a whole session on BISC Fusion. Oh, okay. yeah. So, yeah, the Fusion, yeah, in brief, the Fusion is the, it's the Fusion of hardware and software. So, uh, we're, we're selling a computer with the sky already installed on it. And it's a it's a it's a turnkey imaging system, meaning that it's just a it's a box. You turn I used to, I called it Skybox. So in development, it was just a, the sky in a box. You turn it on, it boots up into the sky, and you do your imaging. And when you're done, you shut it down. So you don't have Facebook, you don't have Windows updates. Uh, it, it's running Linux and it has our, our native device support, which is you know we support. We actually support more devices under Linux than anybody else, including the, you know, the, the indie uh, stuff with our, our native, our native plugin architecture works on everything, Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, et cetera. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it has power control built in, it's got a built-in GPS, so the time is always accurate, and uh, if you take it to a star party, it, it knows where you are, and it boots up, it makes its own Wi-Fi hotspot, and you can control it with a web browser or your laptop. Um, using a web browser or a, a remote desktop sort of thing. Okay, cool, Richard. And we're going to have you back in June or July or something. And we'll talk okay. About okay. Um, you know, there's like, what, what are we at now? 155? That's not bad. That's like three times usual. So um, <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Hey. Excellent. It's, it's Easter. Nobody has anything else to do. Yeah. And they're all stuck at home. Everybody's stuck at home. They have nothing else to do but watch us. Okay, that uh, was very nice, Richard. But it, we also <laughs> had right on here, and we also had Richard Wright talking about um, CCD versus CMOS. So now everybody's got something to go over to cloudy nights and complain about. Huh? Okay, absolutely. Yeah. A bit. Um, and don't forget, Richard actually knows what he's talking about. So um, that makes it, it even more interesting. By the way. I'm sharing my screen right now. You see right down here where it says subscribe. We sure would love it if you do that. And we want to thank everybody who, you know, put in a little bit of bucks here. Um, it helps us run the show. We will be back next week. And, um, you know, we're all stuck here. We're all doing a good job. It's Easter. And it was one of the weirdest Easter's I've been through ever. Not being up early and up at the top of the mountain and all that other cool stuff. Okay. Um, but it's a great time to do astroimaging, and next week's program is about what we can do with astroimaging because it is a great time to be doing astroimaging. Then again, it's always a great time. So that's it for the night. And Tolga, if you could take us out, please. Bye. Bye, everybody. Uh, Richard, you can stay on the hangout. Good, good night, everybody. Okay. <laughs>